what makes it a really good hot spot for butterflies in this area. Uh, for this next segment, I'm going to talk more about the different species that you can find here. I'm not going to go over all 124 of them, but I've picked up, I'm going to cover the six family groups, and then I will talk about a few examples, some that are either rare that I would really like you guys to keep an eye out for, uh, others that are really common that you probably see a lot, but maybe wondered what they were. So I just kind of picked out a few that I thought you guys would be interested in. So there's six butterfly families. Uh, you can see the numbers here are how many species in each family are found in Okanagan County. As Brady are the skippers, so those are going to be your small little butterflies. Uh, a lot of people mistake those for moths, or they don't even realize that they exist. They're just buzzing around with their feet. Uh, swallowtails, those are probably the most obvious. Uh, also, Nephalidae, those are a little bit bigger butterflies too, so a lot of people recognize those. Monarchs belong to Nephalidae family. And then you've got Lycinidae, Briodinidae, and Pyridae. Those are kind of your medium to small butterflies. So for Hesperiidae, the skippers, they're mostly small. They have a wingspan that averages around one inch across when their wings are spread open. Uh, when their wings are folded, they're probably about the size of your thumbnail. Some of them can be a little bit bigger. Uh, they have a very fast buzzing flight pattern. So a lot of these, especially the little orange ones, even though they're very bright orange, when they're flying, they can just look like a little black housefly buzzing around, just zip, zip, zip everywhere. Usually only flying about a foot or two above the ground. Uh, dusky wings, there are, I think, three species of dusky wings up here. A lot of people mistake these for moths because they pretty much look like it. They're a little brown, black, nondescript butterfly that buzzes around and spends a lot of time on the ground. Um, but they're pretty cool. So if you take a closer look, you'll see um, some of the markings on them. Bacuvius dusky wing, I mentioned earlier. The larvae feed on Sanothus. And they have kind of this russet, a little bit of a reddish brown patch in the middle of the wing here. Uh, they're very difficult to tell apart from Perseus dusky wing, which is a very common butterfly and more widespread than Pacuvius. Um, and Pacuvius actually went uh, at the Sinlahika and we didn't know that it occurred there for several years because I just assumed everything was Perseus until I found this one. It's in the picture and I thought, oh, it looks a little funny. And I couldn't quite put my finger on it, but I took a picture of it, and then I collected it just in case it was something special, and took it back and studied it more closely and found out it was a Bacuvius dusky wing. So then when I was preparing for uh, my Sinlahika book, finishing that, I was looking back through all of the photos that I had taken over my years coming up here to the Sinlahika and discovered that I had at least two other photos of Pacuvius dusky wings that I had always just written off as Perseus. So that's added to our record. So it's something to watch for. Um, you'll, you'll see a lot of the little brown butterflies buzzing around and you probably won't get a close enough look to figure this out. But if you do get a photo, it's worth a look. So this, these are like a half inch? Uh, the full wingspan, so from this tip to this tip, uh, these guys are a little bit bigger, so these would be just slightly over one inch. Uh, these guys are pretty much exactly at one inch across here. Uh, and also the two, you'll notice the brown ones versus the orange ones. Uh, not always, there's a couple species in both directions, but um, most of the ones that are orange are grass feeders. So the caterpillars feed on different grasses. Uh, there's a couple species that feed on sedges. Then we've got these guys here, the dusky wings. These usually feed on legumes. So like I mentioned, the Perseus dusky wing feeds on lupin. Um, some of the other ones, I think, are on like, um, like other parts of the US, not Washington. Feed on indigo, things like that. These guys, like I said, feed on sand of this one, not like you. And um, one of the other species feeds on willows and a couple other trees, I think. Oh, sorry, I forgot. Uh, most of these 
guys on the winner's larvae. So that's something else I'm going to point out as I go through each of these is each of these groups overwinter in different stages. Um, so some overwinter as adults, some as the egg, some as the larva, some as the pupa. So then after each group, I'm going to have a couple examples. So we're starting off here with the skippers, and I wanted to point these out because we have a native Eureta skipperling and the non-native European skipperling. Now these guys, I wouldn't really qualify them as invasive because they're not damaging anything. They might compete with Greta a little bit, but butterflies usually don't have a problem getting along with each other. Uh, and European skipperlings have been in the U.S. for a long time. Uh, they were introduced in the eastern side of the U.S. and they've gradually been moving west across the northern part of the country. So kind of in the Great Lakes region, spreading through Montana, and they've made it into Washington in the last couple decades or so. And uh, I can't remember, I think they, they've been recorded in eastern Okanagan County now, the northeast corner. Uh, I don't remember when the first sighting was, but it was probably like 10 years ago or so, maybe a little more recent. Um, but the way you tell them apart, Obviously, they're both very, very similar. So at first glance, you're not going to know that you're looking at two different butterflies. But these guys, they're slightly bigger. The dorsal side is more of this even-toned brown and orange color. This, it's like an orange base color with brown scales sprinkled all across it. Compared with the European skipperling that has the bright orange base color, and then the wing veins are striped with brown, and then they have a broader brown margin on their wing. And then the ventral side, again, very similar, but these guys have this bright orange band across the hind wing, and then the rest of it's kind of this pale yellow color, and then these guys have just that overall dusky tan look. So very subtle, but if you get a picture of them, it's pretty easy to tell them apart just a little closer look. So that's something to keep an eye out for. Um, like I said, there's not a whole lot of records in Okanagan County yet, but if we have more eyes out there looking for it, maybe we'll get some in and be able to document it better as it is you know, further marching east or see if it just stays here. Um, I don't know if it'll make it over the Cascades or not. <coughs> Next we have swallowtails and carnassians. There are two species of carnassians in the state, Clodius and mountain carnassian. Clodius does not occur in Okanagan County, I think. <laughs> um, there's 124, sometimes I lose track. Uh, they're mostly from the crest of the Cascades to the west, and the larvae feed on bleeding heart. So obviously more of a west side, a damp forest kind of butterfly. Uh, there are a few populations on the east side, like in the northeast, far northeast corner of the state, and I think down in the southeast corner. Maybe. Don't quote me on that. Uh, <laughs> very large butterflies. You'll see them. These frequently will come to your garden. They like to nectar on a lot of different things. Um, brightly colored, so they draw a lot of attention. Um, I think there's eight species of swallowtails in Okanagan County. Uh, you've got western tiger swallowtails, which are by far the most, most common. Uh, they're your typical yellow swallowtail with the black tiger stripes. You've got two-tailed tiger swallowtails, which you can kind of see up here. They're a little bit bigger on average, and they have a very thin tiger stripe. So that's how you can identify them. And they have two tails, but you have to get a close look to be able to see that. And then here in the corner, you can barely see the pale tiger swallowtail. These guys are white, or they can be kind of a creamy color with broad black stripes. So there's three species right there. And then we've got anise swallowtail. Uh, I'm going to talk about Oregon swallowtails on the next slide and um, something to watch for because Oregon swallowtails and anise swallowtails are very, very similar looking. What you want to look for is the eye spot. So if you can get a photograph of that, then somebody like me could tell you for sure, you know, what you're seeing. Because what you want to, what you, what you're looking for is the black dot 
on that I spot there, for it and his swallowtail is going to be completely surrounded by red, and the black dot is going to be pretty much a dot, a circle, surrounded by red. Now with the Oregon swallowtail, it's kind of a squished black dot, so it's not perfectly circular, and the yellow touches it on the bottom side, and then the red is just on the top. So that's how you tell them apart. Uh, also, these guys tend to be a little larger on average. The yellow is a little bit brighter, kind of a paler yellow. And a swallowtails, the black markings are a little bit more bold. So they just kind of look like a small, darker butterfly. And then Oregon swallowtails are this bigger, bright yellow butterfly flying around. Uh, these are pretty cool. Like I had mentioned before, talking about fire, they uh, only the caterpillars only use Artemisia dracunculus. And of course, this doesn't occur everywhere in the state. So this butterfly can only live where that plant is. So you're, you don't always see them. And they, uh, they fly for about three weeks in the summer. So if you're not there at the right time in the right habitat, you're not going to see them. Uh, but a really good place, one of the best places in the state, I think, to find them is the Senlahican. It's very reliable. Um, usually, if you are there at the right time of year, you're going to see these guys. And while they're caterpillars and their pupae, which right here is a chrysalis, are very well camouflaged on the plant, because they're so big, you can actually spot them fairly easily if you know what you're looking for. So these guys, of course, being green, they're a little bit harder. Uh, the caterpillar is bright green, but it has these uh, black and yellow bands, kind of diagonal bands across it. So you want to look for something kind of striking like that sitting up on the plant. Here today, whites and sulfurs. So these guys have very light, airy flight pattern. It's kind of floating around. Uh, they're a more delicate butterfly. Their body is a little bit more slender compared to swallowtails and skippers. Skippers are very robust, large body and tiny little wings. Uh, these guys usually emerge a little bit later. Uh, some of the whites will be the first out in the spring, but most of the sulfurs emerge in late June through July. Uh, they overwinter as larvae or pupae. And so especially the ones that overwinter as larvae, that's why the adults are emerging a little later in the season, because the larvae come out and then they spend a little more time eating before they pupate and then emerge. So I've I uh, chose to talk about this one for two reasons. One, uh, I frequently am asked questions about it. A lot of people notice these. They're one of the first butterflies to fly in the spring. Uh, they're really pretty butterfly and really easy to identify. They're the only one that looks like this. They're white with the orange tips. Uh, males are white with a big orange tip. And then the females are usually kind of this creamy yellow with a smaller orange patch and a little bit of the yellow coloration on the tip here. Uh, every once in a while you'll find a female that's white, but you know it's a female because of the wing tip looking different. And then the ventral has this really cool marbling pattern on it. So if you see a small white butterfly flying around in the early spring, it could be a cabbage white, but Watch for any other little coloration on it. If it has that orange, you know immediately that this is what it is. Uh, something else I wanted to point out was this is now called the Julia's orange tip. Uh, up until last year, I think, everybody knew this is the Sarah's orange tip. But someone I know in Utah has been studying this group for over a decade and doing a lot of research rearing caterpillars from all across the western US and through all of that research has written and published a paper showing that the Sarah orange tip complex is actually three species. So the true Sarah's orange tip butterfly, Anthocris Sarah, is primarily only found in California. Uh, it comes up just a little bit into southern Oregon and then there's a subspecies that's kind of along the border of Nevada and I think there's one into Arizona a little bit. Uh, Thusa is another one that's more of a Utah, Colorado area, but everything in our area, um, almost all of Oregon except for that little southern bit, 
all of Washington, Idaho, and up into Canada is now the Julia's orange tip. So you'll still see Sarah's in a lot of field guides, and they, my field guides still have Sarah because I wrote, I published those before this paper came out. I knew this was coming, but we can't put it in there until it's official. So. And margin white. This is a kind of a neat butterfly. So uh, if you saw this out somewhere, you'd probably just think it was cabbage white. You wouldn't be too far off because it's the same genus, but it's a different species. Cabbage white was introduced from Europe and is pretty much everywhere on the globe except for Antarctica. And I wouldn't be surprised if it showed up there. Somebody carries it into a luggage or something. Um, but this guy occurs in North America and it's very similar to cabbage white. It has a very similar looking larva, egg, pupa. You probably have seen these on your cabbage if you are a gardener. Um, but they don't have any black or gray wing markings really on their wings. Some on, um, on the west side <coughs> can have a little bit of black that makes them look a little like a cabbage white, um, but just not quite. So these guys are primarily a west side butterfly. They're very common where I'm from in Kelso, uh, pretty much everywhere west of the Cascades. But there's a subspecies that lives in the northeast corner of Washington. And these guys just come into the eastern edge of Okanagan <coughs> County a little bit. So it'd be worth it if you're out um, in the Okanagan Highlands close to the county border, keep an eye out for these guys. Uh, they can have multiple broods through the year, so you could uh, encounter them at any time. Uh, their caterpillars only feed on native mustards, which I've got a picture up here. Um, this is what, this is actually the plant that I found this egg on. Uh, I reared it through on broccoli leaves, so they, they will eat other uh, broccoli and cabbage, things like that, from your garden. But in the wild, they don't seek that out, and they really, I don't think they would ever purposefully lay their eggs in your garden unless they're desperate. Next we've got Lycenidae. These are small butterflies, but they pack a punch. They're so pretty. Um, and if you remember what I was talking about with the scales, how some of them have those microscopic grooves and ridges so they can reflect light and be kind of metallic, most of these butterflies have some sort of a metallic color to them. Uh, they're also pigmented, so purplish coppers are mostly kind of an orange brown. This is a female here. Uh, but the males will have these scales that, in the right light, they, they look just like a typical brown butterfly. But you shine them, tilt them a little bit, and they'll glint purple. Like brilliant purple in the sun. Really, really pretty. Uh, blue, whoops. Blues. These guys do not have a blue pigment. They're actually a, pretty much a gray-brown butterfly. But the scales are structured to reflect that blue, which is the same as morphos in South America. Actually, if you get the wing of a morpho butterfly wet, it will be brown. And I learned this accidentally. <laughs> uh, when I was rehydrating a specimen I was trying to spread, and it got a little bit of water on the wings. And once, it, once that happened, even after the water dried, it never regained that reflectiveness. The, the scales were damaged, so it just looks like these big brown blotches on the wings that aren't reflecting anymore. <coughs> these guys, usually uh, the coppers, most species of coppers overwinter as eggs. Most species of blues overwinter as a mid instar larva, which means they've eaten for a little bit and gotten about half as big as they're going to and then they overwinter, and then they come out in the spring and finish eating, and then pupae. Uh, a few species of blues overwinter as a pupa. Uh, there's also hair streaks in this group, and those really vary depending on the species, which stage they overwinter in. They have a very fluttering flight, usually flying pretty close to the ground unless they're disturbed, or they get chased up by a bird or something, they'll shoot up into the air really high and take off over the treetops. One example is a mariposa copper. Uh, like the purplish copper, these guys have these really brilliant reflective scales. And even though this 
is a subspecies called iridescent copper because these are more iridescent than the other subspecies. This looks so brilliant because of the type of uh, photography equipment I was taking. So I used a rain flash. So the flash is all the way around the butterflies and the light came from all angles and really got that colorful look to it. Um, this one, I can't remember if I used the ring flash or just my normal flash, but this is what they usually look like to the naked eye. If you just see it flying around, you might get these glints of purple like this every once in a while, but most of the time that's what your eyes are going to be registering. You can kind of see the little hints of the purple there, but it's mostly just kind of a brown butterfly. Uh, these guys have several subspecies across uh, the western U.S. In Okanagan County, they're pretty much split right down the middle. The west side of the county has the iridescent subspecies, and the east side has Tia's copper. This is actually named after Bob Pyle's late wife, because he helped redescribe this group, and they named a few new subspecies, including this one. And this one is known because the ventral side of the hind wing is a lot darker than the other subspecies. Um, this actually, this picture is kind of a, one on the light end of the spectrum. They can get quite blackish along this border here. And a really good place to find these is around Mount Hull. You get up into some of those open meadows under the pine trees and you'll start seeing those in um, June, I think is probably, or July. July is a good time to find them. Uh, their caterpillars eat vaccinium species, so native huckleberries, uh, cranberries. I don't know if you have cranberries up here, but on the coast, uh, where you have all the cranberry bogs and stuff, there's a lot of native cranberries there too, and there's a, a couple subspecies of mariposa coppers that grow over there too. Um, but on this side of the mountains, they're mostly a high elevation species, because you got to get it up where the huckleberries are. Uh, so. These guys, we've never recorded them on the Sinlahican yet, because I think it's just a little too low. There is a possibility we could get them on the, the west side at the highest elevations within the boundary of wildlife area. But mostly if you want to see these, you need to get up into the Cascades. Uh, get up Totes Coulee Road towards Long Swamp, and then up into that whole area, 30 Mile Meadow, that whole road through there.